Finding Joy in Service. It's the title of this talk. Now, one of the things that um, I find hard to do is to put the needs of others before my own. If you could see into my house, um, you'd see a very selfish person residing there. I don't like being inconvenienced. I prefer to do things within my comfort zone and preferably not to have to go the extra mile. Life is hectic and it's hard enough keeping my own head above water with my family, let alone having to look after the needs of others. I don't know about you, but I do struggle in this area. I find it tough, not just to look to my own interests, but also to the interests of others. When my children were little, they learned a song at Sunday school, and this is how it went. Stop and think, don't be so fast. If you want to be first, you must be last. It's upside down and hard to do, but you should put others first before you. If you want to be great, if you want to be tall, you must be a servant of all. Such simple words, but oh so hard to do. Yet as we think about the Christian life, this servant attitude is what needs to mark our character. The New Testament is clear that when we come to Jesus, we are joined to his body, to his people, and we are called upon to serve one another in love. Jesus himself taught us that greatness is to be found in humble service of other people, so that even Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. And he commanded that we are to copy him. Now here in Philippians 2, Paul reminds us that our attitude is to be the same as that of Christ Jesus. You see, my attitude will shape how I serve God and his people. Attitude always shapes behavior. And so today, in this final talk, I want us to take a look at the attitude of Jesus as we see it here in Philippians 2, and then to look at our own attitudes and to see whether or not we are serving as Jesus did. Philippians chapter 2 is all about how Jesus transforms our attitudes and our conduct. Paul says that we are to model our lives upon Jesus and that if we understand how Jesus has served us, then we will be able to serve one another. So let's work with that passage that was read for us, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Point number one, the call to serve, if you're taking notes. Cast your eye down to verses 1 and 2. Paul says here that we are to love one another wholeheartedly. That's his urge to these Philippian Christians. They are to live together in unity. So Paul says there's to be no division amongst them. If you look down at the end of verse 2, Paul says there they are to be one in spirit and in purpose. And what is going to threaten this being one in spirit and one in purpose? Well, verses 3 to 4 tells us that these Christians are to avoid self-centeredness and pride. They're not to look to their own interests, but instead to the interests of others. And so in Paul's mind, where there is self-centeredness and pride, there cannot be unity and oneness. Self-centeredness and pride is the threat to living in unity, to being one. At the heart of division, quarreling and fighting, says Paul, is selfishness and pride. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because when I'm number one, everyone else has to come second. But Paul is clear here in verses three and four that if we are followers of Jesus, then we are not to be first. Look at his command in verse three. Rather than being selfish and vain, in other words, rather than thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought, we are to be humble, says Paul, and to consider others better than ourselves. Look at verse four. We must think not of ourselves, but we are to look to the interests of others. 
we're to look out for them as if they're number one, not me. So how do we change the attitude of our own hearts from self to others? You see, you can't read these verses and think about how it applies to your husband <laughs> or to the person next to you here today. This is to start with each one of us. Each one of us is called, verse 5, to have the same mindset, the attitude of Christ Jesus. I love that word mindset. We to have the same clear thinking, the same vision, our hearts and minds set on the same thing as that of the Lord Jesus. And yet this can be so hard. So the question I often find on my lips is, why should I? Now, why should I unpack the dishwasher? I did it yesterday. Why should I give more of my time to that woman in my Bible study? My goodness, she never seems to learn. Why is it always me who has to keep helping that student in my class? They never seem to do anything for me. Why should I? I should, says Paul, because God himself came and he served me. God in the person of Jesus has come and shown us the ultimate act of service. He is the God who came to serve. Look down at verse 6. And here's where I need you to really keep it together and follow the logic in Paul's mind. So we're told, verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. You see, we're told here that Jesus is fully God, equal with the Father in every way. Yet, Jesus did not demand his position. He didn't consider his position something to be exploited for his own advantage. Though he was fully God, Jesus did not demand his rights. We live in an age of rights. If you just say boo to me and I don't like it, I'll sue you. <laughs> but here is Jesus, God in every way, and he doesn't demand anything. Though he shared eternity with his father, yet he was prepared to let go of all his privileges, all his rights as God. He refused to lay claim to them. And if you look at verse 7, what did he do instead? He made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus made himself nothing. Though he was fully God, king of the universe, the one who made everything, and for whom everything exists, he descended down from heaven and became one of us. Jesus, who is fully God, literally emptied himself into a human body. But Paul tells us that he didn't cease to be God when he did it. No, no, in becoming a man, Jesus didn't empty himself of his deity or his godness, if you like. As God, ladies, as God, Jesus became a man and he emptied himself in that he let go of all the rights of God in order to serve us. Ray Galea explains it like this. He says, Jesus doesn't stop being God, but he starts being human. Jesus, who is fully God, now takes on full humanity. He isn't part God and part man. No, no. He is fully God and fully man. The moment the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in Mary's womb wasn't the moment Jesus began existing, but it was the moment that the eternal Son of God became the eternal Son of Man. Jesus, who is fully God, stepped as God into a human body and as God became a servant. 
And the word servant here in verse 7 in the Greek, it literally means a slave. And a slave is one with no rights. They've got no rank, no privilege, no power, absolutely no significance or status other than being there to serve. And so Jesus used the wealth and the power and the privilege of his position, not for self-advancement, but to take on the form of a slave in order to serve you and me. The eternal son of God, the second person of the Trinity, descended down into your shoes and mine and served us. This is the instruction of verse 3 to 4, put into action by God himself. Again, Reagan Lear has put it like this, and I find this so powerful. He says, Jesus laid his, aside his divine privileges and allowed himself to be breastfed, to have his nappies changed, and to have a dummy put in his mouth. God slept head to toe with a donkey in a manger. God, in his very nature, is a servant. A wise lady once said to me, if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. You see, in a world where you would be lucky if someone crossed the road to help you, God crossed the universe to meet you in the flesh. In an age of rights, we are called to have the mindset of Jesus, who though he shared eternity with his father, he let go of that face-to-face -face fellowship and he came down and he lived the life of a servant. Is this the attitude with which you live in your home or at your office? Is it the attitude that marks how you relate to those in your church family? Can we say, ladies, that we are serving as Jesus did, or at least that we want to serve as Jesus did. Even as a Christian, do you still expect or even demand some right that you think is owed to you? Well, if you do, that attitude, that selfish attitude, will limit your ability to serve as Jesus calls us to. It will hinder how you imitate Christ. If you reserve some line that you will not cross for others, then you have not taken on the attitude of Christ. In his commentary on Philippians, William Taylor from St. Helens Church in London shares the true story of a theological college in Australia in which a couple of years back there was quite a financial crisis. The leaders of the college appealed to the student body to take on the task of cleaning the college so that they could minimize the expenses um, they were paying to cleaning companies. Well, students signed up voluntarily for all the tasks except for one. Nobody wanted to clean the toilets. The faculty appealed and appealed for help with no success. Yet strangely, during the entire time, the toilets remained clean. One morning, one of the students went down to the loo to find none other than the principal of the college, down on his hands and knees, doing the cleaning with the scrubbing brush. This is selfless sacrificial service. You see, that principal understood. He understood what Jesus has done for us. He understood that if God could cross the universe to meet us, then we can scrub the toilets for each other. But ladies, remarkably, our God doesn't just take the step from heaven to earth, from God to God-man, but he takes the step to death, even death in our place. So look down at verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So the very hands that flung stars into space are the same hands that surrendered to cruel nails. He was obedient to his father all the way to death. 
So Jesus isn't just a servant. He is a willing servant. A willing servant. His death in our place wasn't forced upon him. Ray Galea says that Jesus wasn't nagged by the Father, nor was he trapped by the Father's plan. No. Jesus made himself nothing. He humbled himself. He was not humbled by the Father. His death was, yes, the Father's plan, but it was the Son's choice. This was a choice by the Son of God to come and to humble himself and to pour himself into a human body. Jesus chose the wretched, cursed cross and allowed himself to hang there, being judged in our place. You will have noticed um, in verses 5 to 9 that that is actually a quote. It's in italics. It should be in your Bibles in italics. It's actually a quote taken from Isaiah 53, which is probably one of the most famous Old Testament passages about the cross. And in Isaiah 53, it speaks of the servant or the slave of God going obediently to his death, like a sheep to the slaughter. The servant or the sheep being slaughtered here is Jesus, the Lamb of God. And in the Old Testament sacrificial system, sheep never went obediently or willingly to be slaughtered. You know, they didn't stand in the queue going, pick me, pick me. They just had to go. But Jesus, he chose. He volunteered. He went willingly. Back then, lambs were just picked and killed. But not this lamb. He willingly took up our sin, stepped into our shoes in order to serve. But ladies, here's the thing. Jesus blazed the trail ahead of us. Because here in Philippians 2, he is calling us to follow in his footsteps. True service of one another is not about ticking a box or feeling like, you know, we're doing some duty to God or to each other. It's about putting our needs last and the needs of others first, deeply, willingly, from the heart because we are convinced that God did the same for us. So mommy's here today. When you've cleaned up after your family for the 10th time in the day, remember Jesus, the one who crossed the universe for you. Choosing to care for your family's needs. I'm not talking about encouraging laziness. I mean within reason here. But choosing to care for their needs day in and day out is teaching them something huge about God. When they look at you and see a servant, one who considers their needs before her own, they see Jesus, the God who considered their needs before his own. When your husband is under pressure at work and he cannot be as involved as he'd like to be in the home. The temptation is to feel self-righteous because you know, I'm going it alone. And that resentment starts to creep in. In those moments, remember Jesus who gave everything up for you, willingly and without compromise. Remembering Jesus will enable you to give up that extra time for the sake of your husband. When you choose to take your weekend away, but you come back on Sundays so that you can be here with your church family, you are putting their needs before your own. When you choose not to complain about the things at church that are not to your liking, to show grace to those who annoy you, and to keep helping those who need the extra help, those are ways that you are serving as Christ did. That exhausting person who always needs to talk and you see them approaching from the other side of the room and everything in you wants to bolt in the opposite direction. When you give them your time yet again, that is having the mindset of Jesus. Jesus who didn't roll his eyes and who didn't go to the cross begrudgingly. When you choose to use your money for the kingdom, before you use it for your comfort, ah, then you're selflessly putting the needs of others before your own. You see, having the mindset of Jesus 
will impact on the way we spend our time, on how we use our holidays, and how we spend our money. Once we understand what God has done for us in Christ, we can't ever be the same again. Jesus takes hold of us and he rewires us. And we are now wired to serve like Jesus did. And we can do it. We can do it. Because his power works in us. Many Christians down the centuries have experienced this transforming power. I think of Elizabeth Elliot, who after her husband Jim Elliot was brutally murdered by the Orca Indians, amongst whom they served in South America, went back there with her daughter a year later to continue the mission work they'd begun before her husband's death. What makes someone do that? It's what happens when we choose the attitude of Christ. I have very dear friends who left the comfort of Australia to serve as missionaries in the South Sudan. When fighting broke out there last year, amidst the fears of civil war, they had to take their three young children and they fled to Uganda. But they returned to the Sudan a few months later and they lived there in the turmoil, in the uncertainty of it all, until very recently when they had to be evacuated permanently. See, they did that because for them, the spiritual need of the Sudanese people was more important than the fear of persecution. They considered the needs of the Sudanese people to be greater than their own. Elizabeth Elliot and my good friends were driven by this command, consider others better than yourselves because that's what God did when he hung on the cross for you. They had the mind of Jesus who though he was equal with the Father, let go of his rights and he humbled himself all the way to death on a cross. And ladies, having this mindset must transform our relationships. You see, you and I are called to descend into greatness. We like to ascend the ladder. But here, Jesus turns it around. He says, no, no, you go down. Just like I did when I stepped into a human body, coming down the ladder for you. Whatever relationship you're battling with at the moment, understand that coming first in the argument, if you are thinking like Jesus, it can't be about that anymore. It's not about winning the argument. It's not about being proven right. God sees. It's not about shouting the loudest or being the funniest or the smartest in the room. It's not about demanding your right to be understood. It's about being driven by the profound truth that Jesus lived by, looking out for the interests of others. Paul ends this section of Philippians in verses 9 to 11 by showing us that Jesus, the God-man who died in our place, is no longer dead. Paul says he's alive. Look at verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. He descended in order to ascend and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Our Lord Jesus is no longer dead. He is alive. He has ascended to the highest place. As we put on the attitude of Jesus each day, ladies, we are not serving a dead Jew. We are serving the living God. God has given to Jesus an unequaled position. God has given to him an unmatched name. And he has given to Jesus a position of universal rule and authority. He is the king. He is the president. He is the God of this world. You see, the road to glory for us is the same road that Jesus walked. Jesus, the servant king, now rules in glory and we will rule with him one day if we follow in his footsteps. The way to glory is the same road that Jesus walked. It is the road of self-sacrificial service. And so Jesus could say that the first will be last and the last will be first in the kingdom of heaven. Ladies, our great God 
He crossed the universe to meet us. Yet sometimes we won't even, you know, give someone a lift home after church. Our great God willingly descended from heaven and he stepped into our shoes in order to make us right with him for all eternity. Yet we begrudgingly clean up after our children. But you see, if God willingly gave up heaven to come to pay the price for our sin, then the least we can do is willingly, deeply from the heart, give up our time and our rank and our money and our job, whatever it takes, to look out for the interests of others. Uh, William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. He once traveled from England to the United States where he was to be the main speaker at a Salvation Army conference, uh, which was filled with very important delegates who had all come to hear the father of their organization speaking. But William Booth took ill before he could address the conference. I think that's every speaker's worst nightmare. In fact, he was so sick that he couldn't even leave his hotel room. So he was asked to write out his message and someone would read it on his behalf. And so he wrote out what he wanted to say. And it was only one word, others. This word summarizes the attitude of Christ Jesus. So ladies, as we leave here today, let me encourage you, put yourselves out there. Put yourselves out there for the sake of others. That was Jesus' code of conduct. And it must be ours too. And it should be a delight because we are serving the living God. As we live our lives in selfless, sacrificial service of one another, we are glorifying him and working for an inheritance that Peter says will never perish, spoil or fade. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you sent him to descend and to come into our shoes, to die on a cross so that we might live. We pray that you would transform us daily to look more and more like Jesus, our older brother, that we would behave like him and think like him and willingly from our hearts serve as Jesus did. And I pray that as your spirit equips us and empowers us to do these things, that Lord, it will transform our Bible study groups and our homes and our churches and the communities in which we live. We know that in our country, the change that is needed will only come when people turn to Christ, the living and true God, and when they learn to put the needs of others before their own. And we pray that you would start to do that in us and with us. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.